Good afternoon. I'm Jane Rosario, and welcome to today's webinar, Universal Access to All Knowledge. Our presenter today is Brewster Kale, founder of the Internet Archive, the Open Access Coalition, Alexa Internet, and the Kale Austin Foundation, among many other things too numerous to mention here. For those of you who may not be familiar, the Internet Archive is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is building a digital library of Internet sites and other cultural artifacts in digital form. Like a paper library, it provides free access to researchers, historians, scholars, and the general public. During the presentation, if you have questions for Brewster, please type them into the question box on your screen. Brewster will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will be about an hour and a half long. Um, today's session will also be recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording after the conclusion of the webinar. A copy of Brewster's slides will also be provided. If you wish to chat with other attendees during the presentation, you can use Twitter. The hashtag is on this screen. It's um, hashtag, hashtag A-L-C-T-S-C-E, Alex-C-E. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed during the presentation. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Brewster. Excellent. I'm hoping this is working. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm going to assume that there were running, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I feel like I'm living in the future. Um, so this is uh, a talk on, on how we can build universal access uh, to all knowledge. The idea is to really try to get there. And it's now no longer a, a kind of a dream. I think we're, we all um, are in the process of building this. And there's a lot of open issues about costs and what institutions should do, uh, legal issues that are going on, and, and the like. Um, so it's a, uh, uh, exciting, and, but a little complicated, and a little scary uh, uh, time for us all. I think the, both the good and the bad news is that people already expect that it's happened. They, they, when I talk to people, they say, oh, isn't the Library of Congress already online? And the answer is, well, no. Uh, in fact, most of uh, what humans have written, and I'd say even the best we have to offer, is not online yet. So we, as the librarians of the world, and especially right now, our responsibility is to try to, uh, to get there. So what I thought I'd do is go over Basically, uh, so how are we doing uh, towards this uh, goal, sort of globally, and also some of the projects uh, illustrating through the Internet Archives uh, projects that we're working with um, between 500 and 1,000 libraries directly um, to try to achieve this. And I'm hoping out of this that you're um, inspired to do something more differently or work with the Internet Archive or somehow um, try to all of us help get there. The way that I thought I'd um, try to um, do this uh, is to sort of give an idea of who we are and, and, and some of the experiences cost-wise, legally, uh, and institutionally towards trying to get there. We're a nonprofit library located in San Francisco, about 150 people, mostly funded by um, uh, working with libraries to digitize either the web or, or books, and now movies as well. Uh, we see ourselves within the tradition of libraries, uh, like the Boston Public Library carved above its door. I love when people carve in stone, because they really you know, want people to think it for a long, long time. And they carve free to all. And I think that's the role uh, in society that we uh, play. And we have to make sure that we play it well in the digital uh, future. So the, um, then how are we doing uh, towards, uh, towards this? If we take the different media types, books, music, video, software, I'll go through each one of these and then give an idea of uh, what can you do with preservation uh, of these materials once they're, um, once they're digital. 
So if we want to put all books online, then the question is, sort of, well, how many are there? The Library of Congress reports they've got about 28 million books. Um, and if you take a Yale, a Princeton, or a Boston Public Library, it's maybe a 10 million book sort of collection. So 10 million books, and I'd say we're more or less there. Um, if we want, there's always more to do. But a 10 million book library would give um, every person around the world uh, access to the great libraries of the world. Um, and if we take a book and put it into Microsoft Word type format, it's about a megabyte. So a megabyte, there are 20, 28 million megabytes. It goes megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte. So it would be 28 terabytes. And you can buy four terabyte hard drives now at Best Buy. So it's for seven hard drives, you could have all of the words in the Library of Congress. So it's starting to feel kind of doable. Um, there are all sorts of issues to get between here and there. But technologically, the idea of having that on spinning disks and being able to make that accessible to anybody around the world is within our grasp. Uh, people are starting to get used to having uh, beautiful books online. Uh, this is uh, a wonderful book uh, scanned out of the University of Toronto's uh, library um, that is an illustrated sort of color graphic version from the mid-1800s of Euclid's elements. And I used it to teach my child um, Euclid. Um, and it was completely great and very difficult to get a hold of uh, if you don't have, well, hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a rare book like this. But online, uh, it's available for free on a, something that he wasn't going to destroy. So anyway, um, you know, completely great. Uh, also, printing books, again, um, is doable. Um, there are print-on-demand machines, but pretty much there are printers. And if you want to bind it and cut it, you can. And we made a book mobile to basically make it so that you could download, print, and bind any book um, that you could, um, could get, get off of the internet. And it costs about a dollar or a couple dollars a book um, in terms of parts cost. That doesn't count labor. But it's cheap to go and even make books available to people that don't have uh, screens. So we've done this now um, in a few different places. There are a couple in India. Um, there are uh, a couple in uh, Egypt um, uh, that are, or excuse me, one in Egypt. This is the opening day at the Library of Alexandria. And here's an engineer working with a kid. And this is the kid's first book that, this, that he ever owned. So the idea of being able to uh, print and bind and hand out books, uh, we think, is a uh, terrific idea. We even made it work in rural Uganda. What we found is that the technology for distributing information was actually doing pretty well. What we needed to do is try to get the right books. And this has turned out to be a bit more of a thorny problem. So there's going and digitizing uh, older books, but then there's also how are we going to acquire um, newer books in such a way that we can do with them as we want, as opposed to being wrapped in systems that really make things really very difficult to use. So, so there's some new print-on-demand technologies. This is the electronic book um, uh, making machine from on-demand books. Um, that's sort of this amazing Rube Goldberg machine that prints and binds books. Um, but I really like these um, screens that are starting to become much more ubiquitous. This is the one laptop per child, and we've reformatted our books to make sure that they would work for those. And there are basically uh, two million, excuse me, uh, I think two million of these um, in kids' hands in developing countries. So if we can make our books available, um, then in sort of common ways and in ways that they can find them, then there may be a much larger audience for books that might have a very limited audience in our physical libraries. Um, these new tablet things are, are starting to look really, really good. So even scanned books, you don't have to go and necessarily put them into um, machine-readable form. They don't have to be like Microsoft Word. They can be digitized books, and they look beautiful on these screens. Um, so all of that is, is turning out to be to be pretty good. Uh, there's now proliferation, and we're finding that maintenance of our digital files is taking a lot of our time to make sure that the books are in, you know, if Amazon wants it in a different format, and now Apple wants it in yet a different format, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a, um, a talking machine for the blind and dyslexic, so that um, you can download a book uh, and make it, uh, and it will talk to you a little bit like this. But one of the advantages is you can speed it up. And a lot of people like to be able to read things sped up. Um, we, there are also 
we can make all books available all the way to the current day, Harry Potter and all, to, um, to those that are blind or dyslexic. Um, so we've done this with all of the books that we've digitized, and when we've done that, uh, we multiplied the number of books available to that community by a factor of five or ten when we made that available. There are now about 500,000 modern books in, to add to the two million older books that are now available to the blind and dyslexic. And the blind and dyslexic, in many ways, have the best digital library ever made, or it's, um, it's at least accessible to them and not uh, to the general public which I think is, in some sense, kind of good social justice. Um, and that's because there's a particular law that allows it, so we've, we've made it available for free. But there's some amount of going and taking our text and making it available in these different ways. Then how do you get things online? Well, um, it's non-trivial to do it well. Um, this is a, a guy at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt uh, scanning books with an older technology um, that's sort of black and white uh, scanning. Uh, and you can scan pretty fast on that. But we found that if we uh, we tried robots, we tried doing different things, we ended up designing a, a book scanner ourselves with two um, professional grade digital cameras. And we raise and lower glass to flatten the page. But it's non-destructive. It, it doesn't harm the book at all. It doesn't even open the book all the way flat. So it tries to get as good an image of the pages as possible. And then we process them from there. It takes about an hour, full, um, all told, including all the cataloging and QA and uh, all of the whole shebang about uh, digitizing a book. It's about 10 cents a page, all told. Um, so it's about $30 a book, or about the cost of buying a book, to be able to digitize a book, and then you can make it as available as you're legally allowed. I'll go back to sort of what we can do with modern books in a minute. This is what a scanning center of the Internet Archive looks like. This is the one in San Francisco. And we uh, operate 32 scanning centers in eight countries. Um, there are other scanning. Uh, we, we try to scan things kind of close to where they are so we don't end up you know, sending things to other countries and that type of thing. Because things can get lost. And it, basically, you can get, um, basically, you can handle your own books um, is, the, is, is what we've been trying to deal with. And, at this 10 cents a page, we can do it in, in the United States, Canada, Europe, uh, and, the, and the like. Um, and most of the cost goes to, uh, to labor. We're also digitizing other types of things at this point. Um, I'm really excited about this project. It's Balinese. Um, the, the Balinese, I've been asking different um, uh, heads of state and the like, and cultural ministers, can we digitize everything ever written in your language and make it available on the internet? And the answer has been no from Greece and Iceland, and they're just not ready for it. But the Balinese said, great, yes, let's do it. Um, so we've now finished a project to digitize all the works written in Balinese. And the way that they write um, is in, on palm leaves. And these palm leaves, these manuscripts, are, are held in a few of the libraries on Bali. And these are um, two professors that are um, going and cleaning the, uh, the, and so they're preserving the actual Balinese lontar. Uh, and then uh, we photograph them and we put them up on the net uh, for free. And now we're trying to basically transcribe them and make them more useful to the next generation of Balinese so that they don't lose their, their own language context. They're beautiful, um, beautiful works. So basically, we can move at scale. Um, it's pretty much a um, bring forward books. Um, and it's, uh, it's all a known system to be able to, uh, to digitize. We're digitizing over 1,000 books a day uh, in, uh, across the world. So currently, we've got about 3 million books that are available uh, for free on the Internet Archive uh, website, archive.org. And I wanted to ask, actually, a poll, if you would. If we could launch a poll uh, with this cool webinar software, have you ever used archive.org, uh, including the, the Wayback Machine? So if it's possible, I think there's a little toolbar -y thing. Um, if you wouldn't mind, that would be helpful for me to know whether to, uh, you know, and also maybe encourage you to try out archive.org to go and download a book um, or try the Wayback Machine. There are um, now many more than 250,000 
modern ebooks for the blind and dyslexic, and there are 200,000 modern ebooks in the lending library. And we think of there as maybe 8 million books to go to get to be a Boston Public Library, a Princeton or a Yale class library. So texts, I'd say we're, we're, we're moving along, but then there's the question of how can you deal with the, um, the um, copyright issue. Um, we built another website called openlibrary.org that's really designed around books. Um, and it gets about 150,000 visitors a day. It's one web page for every book. And it's basically a Wikipedia of books. We've also woven into it an ability to borrow ebooks. So this is a, a different kind of thing. We go and buy ebooks from publishers, but buy in the same sense that we used to buy physical books. So not a license deal where if we don't pay one year, they disappear. It's not do it uh, for 29 uses or whatever it is. It's buy it. Buy it, and then we can preserve it uh, long term. We've not found that many publishers, but I think this is what it is we should do as libraries, is make sure that we spend our money buying things, not renting uh, things. Um, and it makes all the sense in the world. We're also digitizing um, books um, such that we can lend them. So we own a physical copy, and we then loan one copy using the same protection mechanisms that the publishers use for their books to make these things uh, available. So um, if you go into a Boston Public Library or a thousand other libraries, or actually if you're in five different states in the United States, because we're working with the state librarians um, in uh, the United States, and they're turning on whole states at a time, such as, uh, such as California, for instance. If anybody in California goes and tries to borrow a book, they can borrow any of 200,000 books. And everybody that's, in, that's outside of those states or outside of those libraries or um, can get to I think 10,000, 20,000 books. So if you go into any of these libraries, you can get more books. Uh, and we very much encourage you to, uh, to join this system. It's free. And I'll say a little bit of how to do that. If you want to borrow a book, um, then uh, you can select the book and say, oh, I really want HTML for web designers, but oh, it's already been checked out. So you might want to put it on your list um, and say, gosh, I want to add to my list to be able to go back to, to get that book. But let's go to a less popular book. Here's a book that was um, from the Boston Public Library. So this is a book that they have that's from 1994 that uh, we digitized at the Boston Public Library, and they're lending it out. So this is a modern book. They didn't get permission, um, but they have a physical copy, and they've digitized this, and they're lending it one person at a time. And it comes from the Boston Public Library. You can say whether I want to read it in a browser or download a PDF. One of those funny PDFs like Overdrive does that explodes after um, uh, two weeks and are kind of clunky. We, we suggest the, uh, the read in a browser. Uh, if you read it in a browser, then it says, gosh, it came from this library. Um, and this has been going on for several years. And it's been all working, no, no complaints, uh, and scaling up. Um, so now here I've, I've borrowed a couple different books. Um, and you can then check them, check them out, or they basically automatically get checked back in after two weeks with no, with no lending fees. If you would like to join up, please write to Robert at archive.org. Basically, you have to contribute at least one modern book, um, and make sure all your public domain books are, are public domain. Uh, give us the IP addresses, contact info, and then your patrons can uh, borrow 200,000 different titles, um, and that might be. It, we see it as a way of getting through some of this thicket and having libraries be libraries. So that's sort of how we're dealing with some of the um, more recent books. Um, and the idea is, you know, we can do this. To do this modern books, we can buy, buy books from publishers, we can scan our or older books, we can give away public domain books, uh, and it's, it's working. So audio. What would it take to try to do all of audio? Well, um, how big is it? It's maybe two or three million discs, so from 78s, LPs, or CDs. Um, but there's also an awful lot that's being created in the internet generation. But there's also there's these uh, communities that want to share. The, putting up Madonna CDs is, of course, a fairly litigiously uh, intense thing to do. Um, don't recommend it. Um, but we've been finding um, that there are lots of communities that are not served very well by the existing music publishing industry, and we can help out uh, in this particular uh, uh, way. Um, 
and by making things uh, available. So we have offered to anybody with audio files unlimited storage, unlimited bandwidth forever for free. And the idea is to try to make it so that if people had cultural materials they'd like to distribute, that we as a library would give it shelf space. And we find that this is not very expensive to do, and we've had lots of takers. One of the major takers of this particular idea have been the rock and rollers. Uh, there's a tradition, started with the Grateful Dead, of trading, um, uh, trading concert recordings. So it's a mechanism of going and making things uh, available as long as nobody makes any money. So these, uh, the Grateful Dead started this and lots and lots of bands uh, copied it. And we now have uh, over a million recordings total and we have a hundred thousand concert recordings and we have everything the Grateful Dead ever did, about four or five thousand bands. So I'd say this all around this whole thing is, uh, is working and we as libraries can play a role for the ad hoc librarians and ad hoc archivists that have collections that want to bring them forward and make them available. And by our being nonprofit, it helps a great deal towards having people not feel like they're being taken advantage of. So the Grateful Dead doesn't object, um, so all these other bands don't object. Um, and because we're not making money off of them. And so I'd say that there's more opportunities here for us to reach out to our communities and offer um, hosting. If we want to go back and digitize, and we've started to do digitization of these, if there are sort of records and LPs, uh, CDs, uh, and 78 RPM records, there may be two or three million of them. They cost between ten and twenty dollars a piece, depends on all the metadata issues mostly, um, to go and put online. But that's twenty or thirty million dollars, and we basically have the world's recorded sound uh, on disk, um, which I think is, uh, is a real bargain. We're not um, very far through this. We're starting to, um, to work with different communities that have already digitized CDs and LPs, and we've done some of the tests to figure out how hard it is. But um, mostly we're dealing with internet uh, music, um, and we now have a million recordings. So the idea is that you can, too, uh, make um, recordings from your communities available. So we have lots of different collections. Um, some are news and some are old stuff, um, and it's really quite popular. Um, we get a couple million people a day coming to the Internet Archives website uh, to go and download um, these sorts of materials. We're about the 250th most popular website. Um, so it's, I think we're by far and away the most popular library or archive out there. Um, and I think it's just because we have the real stuff. We don't just have metadata, we have the stuff itself and make it available. So moving images. So if we have books are doable, Audio is doable. How about moving images? Well, they come larger in terms of the uh, amount of disk space. They also come around with uh, a different community that might get really upset at you if you go and put a lot of Hollywood films online. So we've been generally staying away from those except for ones that are out of copyright. And they've, um, we've got about 1,000 public domain feature length films uh, that are up. But mostly what we've found that's really been interesting to people people are non-traditional uh, moving images. So these are educational films, um, government films, advertisements, training films, um, things done for lectures, those sorts of things. And there's been much more demand for these than I possibly would have imagined. I mean, those social behavior films that I watched in junior high school, there was a substitute teacher, and they'd wheel in the projector and they'd show some dumb movie. Those! And they, we're getting hundreds of thousands of downloads of these, and people are making them and remaking them into funny movies. Or um, I'm not actually sure why they're using them, but they are in our libraries and archives, and there is an audience for these sorts of materials. I think it's because it's, this generation is a very visual generation, and this is a way for them to relate to the 20th century in a way that they really understand what's going on, and it's much less filtered, if you will, um, than what you find uh, through Hollywood. We've also offered um, uh, unlimited storage and unlimited bandwidth forever for free, and people have uploaded things. We don't really compete that well with YouTube. They're, they sort of walk away with it, but there are people that do want to make things available in the library instead of YouTube, um, and those are the sorts of people that we deal with. We're starting to get better at, at uh, home movies and doing things ourselves with 8 and 16 millimeters, um, and it's just not that expensive to digitize film if you're going at scale. So if you have film 
collections, um, it's not that bad um, if you want to go and make them uh, available. Moving images. Well, it's not just movies, it's also television. We've been recording 20 channels of television since the year 2000, and uh, we've been making these uh, uh, only a small subset available at this point. Um, we made September 11th collection available on October 11, 2001. This was before YouTube, and uh, it, it didn't cause um, any real complaints from people. In fact, even the broadcasters were thrilled with it, and we've now gotten donations of September 11th from the New York affiliate of uh, Fox. So there's um, seeing that this is actually not a problem, this is a benefit, but we didn't uh, go back and try to ask permission. If you go to archive.org slash 911, there's, a, I think, a beautiful interface that allows you to browse one week's of television um, and be able to, uh, to see short snippets of it. Um, there's also other more deep research tools, but we think this is a beautiful interface to large amounts of television. We're trying to get television news up um, that's such that it's searchable. We hope to do that fairly soon. Um, so the, even television is doable. If you have video, um, then it's on the order of $25 per video hour to digitize. Um, we have 500,000 videos on the archive. We have millions of hours of television, and lots of people upload things. So even if you're talking moving images, um, it is doable to have all of the um, movies and television um, in our collections in such a way that people can have access to them to be able to do research and educational use. And this, um, I think, is something that we as librarians really need to move into um, very, very quickly and, and um, decisively. Um, otherwise, we will miss out on a generation that's really expecting moving images. So we have uh, lots of different collections, and you can go and host your things on the Internet Archive as well if you'd like. Um, you can put them up on the Internet Archive until you have repository, and then you can go and make copies in, back into your repositories, or just use the Internet Archive as your repository. Um, all of this is available for free. Um, well, sometimes we get some attention that we're not looking for. Um, so the FBI uh, gave us this national security letter. These are one of these um, Patriot Act things that uh, have a gag. So they basically ask information from you and they demand that you never tell anybody that they've even asked for it. I think this is um, a dreadful system. And um, so they demanded some information from us about a, uh, a patron, an, uh, a user of the Internet Archive. And we looked to the library community as to sort of how, what do they do about protecting their patrons? And they, of course, there's a long tradition of protect, protecting our patrons from government intrusion. So we uh, talked to our lawyers at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They said, the only thing you can do to push back, there's no court order remedy, whatever, you have to sue the United States government. So we sued the United States government, and we won. So uh, we've now um, basically redacted the uh, who it is exactly that asked for it and what they, uh, who they asked about, but we published a cookbook of what it is um, that we did and how we responded to this so that hopefully if any of you guys are in the same situation you can go and search the web, find these things to go and find out uh, how did it go for us, who did we talk to. Um, and it was interesting that the FBI really didn't need the information very much at all. Um, they just wanted to get out of the lawsuit as quickly as possible so that basically they wouldn't be a court challenge of their basic law itself. There was a court challenge going through the courts based on an ACLU suit, so we just wanted to produce a, a cookbook. So uh, acting like a library um, does work, uh, even in this digital, uh, digital age. Software. So books, music, video, uh, software. Well, there are only probably 50,000 titles during the package software era, and we're being slow on the uptake there. So there's, there's real room. Mostly this is being done by the hacker community. Um, uh, people that are really interested in keeping video games going. Um, and we're looking to try to work with those guys. But also, I think in general, we libraries are the, we are the establishment. We should work with those guys and make it so that they feel comfortable that they're doing good work. Um, right now, they're feeling quite threatened um, uh, with lawsuits or the like. So and they're really doing first-rate librarianship in, in, in our view. So uh, software is doable, but we haven't, we haven't really what we're probably best known for is collecting the World Wide Web. We've archived the World Wide Web 
about um, uh, a snapshot of every website and every web page on every website. We try to do this every two months, and we've been doing it since 1996. This is what Yahoo looked like in 1996, and the idea was to be able to search, see, see the web as it was, click around. It's not functional, like it doesn't have search engines for back then, but it does have, um, you can click around and see the web as it was. It's sort of an out of print web page as a service. We launched this in 2000. One and it's been going along uh, fine ever since. We basically take things out that people don't want to have in the Wayback Machine, and that's the way um, that we've sort of dealt with the, the bias of uh, some, some things not really being designed to last forever and people being upset, um, but it keeps the whole service uh, running, and it's been going on uh, for over a decade now. And it gets about uh, 500,000 people a day using the service, which is much more than we thought. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a quite a popular um, service and fairly unique. This is what pets.com looks like with the so puppets. Um, but most people seem to look at it for their own old stuff. Um, this is what MIT's dorky website looked like in 1996. Kind of, uh, this is a conference website. Um, so very simple old stuff sort of how things used to look. We've also done things, um, we found that people want to change the past uh, in that sort of Orwellian way. So here's a press release um, from, uh, so that there's, uh, President Bush announces that combat operations in Iraq have ended, and pictures of him on a, on a <coughs> aircraft carrier. But then a couple days later, without any announcement, they just changed the press release to say major combat operations have and this is the, you know, what we're designed for is to basically keep a record, uh, especially of things like governments, um, to basically hold them accountable to what it is they've uh, done in the, in the past. So changing of press releases is kind of you know, an obvious Orwellian thing to do, um, and, um, but there's more subtle things that people um, do. But so having an out-of-print web page service seems like a, it makes sense. We have an archive it tool, it's a subscription-based service. We work with uh, a couple hundred libraries now and they're building uncurated collections where librarians are going and um, uh, selecting the sites and the periods that they should be collected and making them into searchable uh, collections. And this is a, a, a really good back and forth on uh, it's a, a paid subscription uh, service that might be useful um, in, your, in your setting. Uh, we jump into things like the tsunami, and then we've gone and donated those back to the National Diet Library of Japan. Uh, they didn't feel that they could actually uh, do the archiving themselves, so we we worked with them as well as lots of others to go and do this. Okay, so whew, that's books, music, video, software, web pages. The idea that you could collect it all doable. Um, it is within our grasp to go and digitize these things and make them available. Well, what about archives, things that are not published? We're starting to work more and more on these personal digital archives um, or digitizing other people's libraries and making them uh, available. Um, this is still a new area. Um, it's all pretty simple gear, digital cameras, and workflow to try to do this. You guys can do this as well, or you can have us do it. Um, but I'd say it's a good area to go and, and jump into uh, now, as people are starting to become aware that these hosting sites don't work very well. Having your stuff in the cloud is only alive for as long as the uh, website owner wants it to be alive. And, and that's usually measured in years, maybe decades, but not longer. Um, so we're, we're looking to do more personal digital archives of things that people put on other sites. Um, and that's a sort of a, a forward wave of sort of this whole area of building digital libraries. So that's the collecting area. Then the question is, now that you have a pile of this stuff, what do you do with it? Um, how do you go and preserve both the digital and the physical materials that you might have in your collections? And it's getting expensive. and you know, there's more and more physical materials, not just digital materials. How do you do it? Well, if we're, if we're trying to set ourselves up to build the Library of Alexandria version 2, let's learn from the Library of Alexandria version 1, which was a library that was uh, probably best known for not being here anymore, for basically burning or basically dissipating, if 
you, if you will. So what's the lesson for us out of that is make copies. So we've made a copy of our web, co uh, web collection as of 2002, and, and uh, this was 10 years ago, that we donated a copy to the new library of Alexandria, and they've been able to keep it uh, up to date on some of the collections. Um, also in Amsterdam, there's a partial collection uh, under an, uh, a nonprofit uh, there. So the idea is to have uh, these different collections in different parts of the world such that as iron curtains go up and down or, or whatever, because basically what happens to the libraries is they're burned, uh, and they're burned by governments. Um, the Library of Congress is already burned once. Uh, it was by the British. So it, it, will, it will happen to all of our libraries. It will happen to the Internet Archive. So let's design for it. And so this is uh, kind of our, our idea. This is what uh, the Internet Archive server looked like in 2008. 2009, we put in a shipping container. Um, this is the web in a box, if you will. The size of the World Wide Web in 2009 was 20 feet by 8 feet by 8 feet. So it's a you know, manageable size, and it was actually the, the running service of the Wayback Machine. Uh, this is what our newest machines look like. Um, in building we bought in, uh, in San Francisco, um, and so it's the next uh, level for us. We keep copies in multiple places, uh, and we can scale to petabytes cheaply. So it goes mega, giga, tera, peta. Uh, and so we're now at around nine petabytes of total data for the Internet Archive. So archiving your digital collections. If you've got digital materials, um, in the upper left of the archive.org, there's a little button um, to go and uh, to click, and that's a uh, uh, a way to um, to go and upload your own things to the inter internet archive. Um, actually, are there results of the poll? Let's see, 64% voted. That's terrific. So, oh, 86% uh, voted yes that they've used archive.org. That's terrific. Have, um, how about the second poll, which is, have you used Open Library? And specifically, have you used it to uh, borrow a book? So if you wouldn't mind, please um, say yes or no. And again, it's sort of a nudge towards, hey, try this thing out. It's not that hard. Um, to, to try out. But if you want help in, in archiving any of these things, we can, we can help with it. If it takes a lot of labor, which is what it is that costs us a bunch, then we'll have to figure out how to offset those costs somehow or another. But uh, uh, we'd love to, uh, um, to work with you. We're also archiving physical materials now. We're, um, we've figured out how to do it very densely. Um, off-site repositories were just too expensive for us for the set n number of books that we want to deal with. We're now over 500,000 books that are, um, uh, that are in the Internet Archive's collections because people are donating physical books to us. And if, you've got, uh, if you're weeding your collections and the like and would like to have them go to a permanent home, we're looking for one copy of all the books that we don't already have. Uh, and then we package them, we digitize them. Uh, and store them away for the long term. And we put them in these temperature controlled shipping containers. And it's a mechanism for us to um, modularize long term deep storage. It's really not designed to go and peek and poke and get a particular book out, but it might be collection oriented. If somebody want, has a new digital technology to scan, then we digitize hundreds of thousands of books. This would be a way of, of getting 100,000 books easily. Um, uh, also, it might be in the authoritative record, so that if somebody wants to find out what did George Orwell really say in 1984, that you can go back and take the, take the digital book that exists and find where the physical book is and go and see, has the record been changed? Um, so this would be a, uh, uh, another way to do this. Our biggest ebook opportunities for us going forward, we think social reading, reading where other people can um, see the, uh, what you're reading and, and communicate with the community that you want to about what it is you're reading and, and annotations, making beautiful ebooks. But I think our role right now is to buy and lend ebooks. Let's buy ebooks from publishers, let's digitize um, and lend ebooks. That this is, um, we need to establish our role going forward as not just being and yet another subscriber to a commercial database, even a non-commercial database like a Hachi Trust. Let's go and have things on site. Let's have it so that we can actually go and say we are taking care of these ebooks uh, going forward. 
it's not that hard to do. Um, and it's, uh, we've, we've been doing it now for years with digitized materials, new books, um, buying books. I think it's an area that we can really um, move forward with. So in conclusion, universal access to all knowledge. Uh, I'd say it's within our grasp. It's something that we can do. It's up to us to do. It's, it's what we're here for. If we do achieve this, I think it could be one of the greatest achievements of humankind. To be up there with the man on the moon or the Library of Alexandria, that the idea of everything is available to anybody, no matter where they are, what their social station of life is, whether they're associated with an institution or not. If they've got a, a curiosity, um, they can find it in this great library that we're all building uh, together. And uh, ending with another sort of what somebody carved over the door, what uh, Carnegie carved over the door of the library in Pittsburgh was free to the people. And thank you very much, and definitely up for questions. Oh, and yes, please, Kara, could you please uh, say what the uh, results of the second poll were? Ah. So 79% um, said no, they hadn't tried uh, open library, or at least the, uh, not the, the borrowing thing. So please do. Um, pretty slick. Um, it's a first step. We need to work together to, to make things better. But it's a, 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 way, a way forward. So very much would uh, like to, uh, to take any questions um, at all. OK, it, it looks like we're still waiting for folks to type in some questions. Um, I guess I have kind of a general question, if you don't mind, and that is, what got you started on this great idea? Um, well, I'm a geek. Uh, went, went to MIT, and there's the question of what do you do with a technology background? And um, one was protecting people's privacy, but I couldn't figure out how to do that well enough um, with the technology of 1980. So the idea of going and making the Library of Alexandria version 2 seemed like a good idea. And I've just never had another idea since. Uh, and it's been really fun. Um, it's, it's been interesting to deal with sort of the cultural institutions, the technology issues. I had no idea there would be so much in the law area that I'd have to sort of learn and, and figure out and try to figure out how to navigate. Um, but it's been a great direction. Um, I, I was sort of in that era of the artificial intelligence area, and we wanted to bring up our machines to be smart machines, and we've seen data start. So if we're going to bring up you know, these machines, let's bring them up to have good things in them. And I'd say we're, we're doing OK. I mean, the, the World Wide Web is you know, people are using it up a storm. People are turning it to be their library. But it's not enough. It doesn't have the 20th century in it. So we really have to go and do some work now, because every year that goes by is another kid that goes through another year of school without access to the best we have to offer. Very interesting. And we're glad you're out there collecting the 20th and 21st century. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, there's a, a couple concerning funding. Um, where does the money come to pay for the Internet Archives, um, government, corporate, et cetera? Yeah, the Internet Archive is an independent nonprofit. Um, so it's 501c3. We're about $10 million, sometimes up to $12 million a year. Um, our 990s are available um, on GuideStar if you want to see where all of our money is and where, how we spend it. Um, but it basically comes, about $5 million comes from libraries paying us 10 cents a page to digitize books. So, that's, um, so we set up a scanning center. It might cost $100,000 to scan a, set up a scanning center in your library to a $1 million if it's a full-scale one per year. Um, or you can send books to other libraries and have them digitized. So people are doing yearbooks or, or things like that that are very important to their particular communities if they're sort of getting their toes in the water. Or they go and say, I want to go and you know, do marine biology, and I'm going to go and, and make sure that our digital library is, is second to none and our books make it online. So that's uh, where about 5 million of our 10 million comes from. About 2 million comes from libraries that are paying us to uh, collect the web for them, whether they're national libraries or smaller libraries through the archive it service. Uh, and then that leaves about three million, which basically comes from foundations. And uh, recently, that most of the money has been coming from me, uh, the Cale Austin Foundation, um, based on my winning the internet lottery 
uh, years ago. Um, but it, it sort of comes and goes um, through these different uh, uh, foundations. But that's kind of it. Um, so it's not that expensive um, to, to run an Internet Archive. Um, so doing a lot of this technology stuff is not that hard, so you can do it as well. Okay. Um, here's another question. When you say lending a modern book, do you mean a book that is sold as an e-book or a print book that you have bought and digitized? Both. So we have, um, uh, we, we buy as many books in e-book form as we can, but we buy them for real, like buy them, buy them, not, not make it, you know, not a license agreement. But we're finding that not very many publishers are selling in that way. But we as libraries, if we act together and go and say, this is how we want to buy things, you know, if they want to stay in business, or at least if they want to sell the libraries, they'll sell them to us in this way. Um, so we have, I don't know, maybe a thousand titles um, that we've bought that way. But we have 200,000 that we've digitized, so we physically um, own a book or a library partner like uh, Boston Public Library. And now a thousand libraries have, have basically put forward a modern book, post-1923, not rights cleared book. Um, to be digitized and lent under their name. And now it's usually sort of a toe in the water. People would sort of say, okay, well, I don't know, is this going to work? And it does, and then they say, okay, well, here's another hundred or a thousand books. Um, and so the idea is to build up that collection as a community project to uh, build a digitized library. We'd like to buy them all in ebook form. Some of them will never be in ebook form because, you know, they just, they're not commercially viable. Um, and something we'll have to press on our publishers to, uh, to, uh, to sell to us in such a way that we have a preservation and access um, role in the future and not just a customer service on top of a couple of databases that they sell through us. I, I think that would be a horrible future for our libraries. Okay, here's another question. Um, how geographically distributed are your servers to ensure preservation in case of disasters, etc.? Well, we have our, our main servers in San Francisco and our main backup servers in the Bay Area. So you say, well, that's not so great. Um, and uh, that's true. And that's why we have a partial copy in Alexandria, Egypt, under different administrative control, and also a diff uh, different administrative control in Amsterdam. What we'd really like is to have five or six uh, interoperating international libraries, if you will, that basically back each other up so that as uh, time moves forward and things kind of get messy out there, um, that when things settle back down again, they'll help reconstruct the, um, the library. So I, I'd say the biggest uh, fear we have is not so much hard drives or earthquakes or the like. Uh, it's somewhat institutional failure um, and governance. <laughs> OK. Um, here's another question. Uh, what relationship do you have with the Digital Public Library of America, and are you working with, or are you working with those folks, basically? I'm on the steering committee of the, uh, or um, the, the sort of setup steering committee. They're about to change things around, and, and, and we'll all be gone, and they, they've got uh, some money to go and hire an exec director. I'm not quite sure what it is, um, to tell you the truth. Um, I, it's, it was started from the, um, the Google Book Libraries. Um, and their uh, orientation towards trying to get copyright law changed makes me a little worried. Um, in this. I think they, we've seen copyright law not be changed very well, um, at least for the public's point of view. It might be if you're Disney, but if not for if you're uh, the public. So um, I think that we should just keep cruising along. Um, we're, we're, you know, I'm, at, I'm working with these guys trying to figure out, you know, can we, can we make it so it will do uh, really good long-term things. Um, but I'd say there's a lot of activities outside of that project that are really also worth um, uh, pushing on and making sure it works well. Okay, that's uh, great. I know um, just from my own experience there have been some wonderful digital archives that are part of grant projects or they're funded by something that goes under and it would have, it would be wonderful if whoever has custody of the information uh, send it to you but 
who knows. Uh, um, let's yes, absolutely. This would be great. Um, you know, a lot of these projects just fade at some point, and you need to put them on the digital bookshelf. And um, we're 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 up for it. So, uh, and we can take quite large collections, and people do. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can you know learn from us and do it yourselves. Um, but it's uh, the idea is to, to to make sure that those projects, as they kind of get put on the shelf. Um, get put on a, on a digital bookshelf that has long-term accessibility. And long-term accessibility is kind of tricky because you have to keep moving the formats forward to try to make it so that movies that were put up 10 years ago are still available to the newest um, newest devices. Yes, and actually as a follow-up to that, um, here's another question. How do you address format obsolescence? Do you have a migration or emulation strategy for either new or previous acquisitions? Um, yes. Uh, well, we're constantly remaking our um, our formats. Um, we we try to keep things the original archive format, of course, but then we have to to continue to move things forward. Uh, like movies have been the one that really hasn't settled down. Uh, when we started, we used MPEG two, but nobody could view those. We tried DivX, which was sort of a funny funky format, and then there was. Um, uh, let's see, the next one was MPEG-1 and then MPEG-4, but it was a different old MPEG-4. Then there was Flash during the YouTube era. Uh, then there's MPEG-4 again, and then there's MPEG-4 again. Anyway, so we use our cluster of computers to, to go back over and reprocess these um, all the time. Our television collection is right now going to run for several months to go and, and produce uh, MPEG-4 uh, versions. So it's... it's um, so our, our approach is to just continue migrating along. Uh, we'd like to see other people go and download and keep copies in other places. We're making that easier using the BitTorrent technology, but also through um, basically automated HTTP downloads. Um, and people are, are, are doing this. Um, and so people can take their you know, particular collections that they want to make sure are preserved and hold them on their own hard drives, or put them in their own cloud provider if they, if they trust those. Great. Um, here's another question. Do you work? Do you do any work with open access materials? Uh, most of the materials we have are open access materials, in the sense that they're either Creative Commons licensed or uh, out of copyright. Uh, we work with uh, maybe that's talking about educational materials, open access educational materials. And we work with some of those communities, and we just basically are a dumping ground, our storage ground. I mean, <laughs> the in Internet Archive it's not an easiest to, to navigate website. So there are often people go put their own websites up that have links and they link back into the Internet Archives versions. So we're kind of the hosting on the back end of the presentation is to something else. So for instance, a lot of MIT's courseware does that or uh, other open access, like LibriVox, which is this tremendous uh, 6,000 audio books of Gutenberg, um, uh, textbooks, so they're out of copyright, Sherlock Holmes, all sorts of great stuff. And they host those on the Internet Archive, but they have their own website. So yes, a lot of the materials on the Internet Archive are open access, even though I've probably concentrated too much on some of the copyrighted materials. Okay. Um, I guess um, coming from an academic library, I don't know if the right word is ironic, but it, it does seem like the environment where I work, people are, um, administration is bent on getting rid of a lot of things and replacing it with technology that's going to answer all our questions. Um, and here you are with all this great technology, and you're being very, very conservative in the literal sense in keeping all this material. So I'm not sure if that's a comment or a question. But, um, oh, please don't throw out your books. If you're going <laughs> to throw out your books, then throw them in our direction. And we'll come and pick them up and, you know, and, and, and try to deal with them. But in general, you don't have to anymore. Um, that if you can go and, and do things densely, one of the big costs of even these off, so having things on your shelves in your, in your um, uh, libraries is very expensive. And there's only a certain amount of space, and there's always more books. So you're going to have to keep weeding. But what do you do with them when you weed? Well, they're in these off-site repositories, but they're still extremely expensive. But they're trying to make it so that you can retrieve something within, um, within a certain amount of time. Um, and that makes it kind of expensive to operate. If you give that up and put them into boxes with catalogs so that, you know you know where they are, so that you can get them back out if you wanted them, uh, which is what we do, it's not that expensive to go and put things in boxes on pallets 
and we put them in these temperature and humidity control shipping containers. You just don't have to throw things out anymore. Please stop throwing things out. We want more copies. You say, well, the Library of Congress is going to keep a copy. Yes, but have you ever gotten a book out of the Library of Congress? I haven't. Um, so the I, it's not very accessible. We're going to want several different repositories with different mindsets. And that's why we started building um, our own. Well, that sounds great. Are there any more questions out there? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, I Thank guess we... Thank you very much for coming. Yes. Thanks to uh, everyone today. Oh, let's see. We've got a couple more questions. Um, do you collect only in English? No, we collect everything. And we collect all media types. So then we try to digitize those and make them accessible. We have, I don't know, over 100 languages in the books that we have already. And we use OCR to try to get them to be more accessible. But we need to get the, the next thousand languages. Um, and that's going to be tricky because there's not a real commercial um, goal at the end of that rainbow. So I think it's going to have to be we in the nonprofit community are going to have to go and try to make it so that we support and encourage a thousand different living languages. Um, but we collect uh, materials, photographs of materials in, in every language. Okay. All right. Let's wait a few seconds to see if somebody else wants to chime in in the question pane. Ah, I actually got another question. Here is the question. How do you verify your data through this constant transformation process? Um, the we try to keep the originals as is, bit for bit, and we, we uh, try to confirm those with, with checksums. Uh, and we keep two copies in different places so that you can go and, and, uh, and check up on the originals. And then there's the what happens as things get transformed from one format to another. And we just try to do as good a job as we can. And by providing the originals so people can go and cross-check them, they can go and say, hey, that wasn't good enough. That was compressed too much. Or, or something. So um, there's, there's the idea of malicious changing, which we haven't seen a lot of, we don't think. Um, and we try to verify against technological changes based on, uh, uh, on checksums. In terms of uh, malicious, I guess it's just have multiple copies in different places. Um, and that way, uh, there's provenance and, uh, and institutional uh, responsibility. OK. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Could a library in a developing country download your ebooks and serve them locally on their own server? I'm thinking in regard to the, and then it says something I don't understand, to the OLPC. But, uh, oh, yes, the OLPC is the one laptop per child. Ah. Um, yes, certainly for all of the, um, the public domain materials are available in bulk. Um, for robotized downloads, and people do. It gets trickier when you're dealing with the uh, modern books, so the post-1923 books, and we only keep those on a couple of servers here. And how do we go and make those available more effectively in other places uh, while still uh, not getting publishers too upset? I'd say we're still in early days, so we don't have as many copies or ability to do that kind of thing as easily as we'd like. Of course, all the open access materials that are being developed for uh, for developing world, or you know, in the United States, which is feeling more and more like a developing world, um, is uh, are all available in bulk and downloadable and copyable. Okay, um, got to thank you for that. Um, let's see, anybody else out there? Okay. Well, I think perhaps it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Brewster. Thank you very much. Um, really enjoyed your presentation today. And um, uh, thank you to everybody who attended. Let me show my screen so you can see upcoming um, Alex CE learning opportunities. We hope you will join us for some of those. I also need to tell you, you will receive a short evaluation form in your email.
email, and we'd really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to respond to it. Your comments are very valuable, and they do help us plan future offerings. I also want to thank um, Kira Healy, Julie Reese, and Aaron Boyd for all their work behind the scenes in producing this webinar. And thank you again for joining us, and have a good day.